There are seven YouTubers that perfectly represent the seven deadly sins, and we'll be talking about all of them starting with gluttony. Gluttony is thought of as an intense desire to consume more than necessary, and while this video's candidate can definitely fit into that category, she fits gluttony in a different, unique way. Her name is Jaybay, or Jalen. She's a YouTuber that would describe herself as a quote-unquote fat activist. A fat activist is someone who classifies being overweight in the same category as other immutable characteristics like the color of your skin, although there's a pretty significant flaw in this logic. Unlike the color of your skin, being overweight is something that can be changed with hard work. Now, let's talk about Jalen. She doesn't represent gluttony in the classic way like Nikocado or Amberlynn Reed does. Those candidates slowly but surely realized that eating massive portion sizes of food on camera led them to gaining internet fame and easy money. She represents the sin in a more subtle way. She takes the role of someone who is essentially a gluttony apologist, or someone who says there's nothing wrong with gluttony. For example, we can see this mentality in action on one of her blog posts titled Journey to Body Positivity, Acceptance, and Liberation. It's about embracing your body and all its diversity and shouting from the rooftops that you are beautiful just the way you are. This journey is about rocking your vessel with confidence, regardless of society's narrow beauty standards. The overwhelming sentiment from Jalen's writing is that your body is perfect exactly the way it is. There's no reason to change it at all, and if you even think about changing it, it's because you're getting tricked by society's beauty standards. Despite her unusual philosophy, Jalen remained relatively under the radar until a few months ago she involved herself in a strange controversy that turned the entire internet against her. Well, Jaylene Cheney made global headlines this weekend after claiming fat people are entitled to extra seats on planes. My plus size travel petition aims to bring attention to the mistreatment plus size travelers face and address the absence of policies catering to our needs. This would involve offering an extra free seat or multiple seats. Well, look, uh, Jaylene. You can have your extra seat, you can have 10 extra seats. You've got to pay for them. If you think plus size discrimination doesn't exist, tell me why there's such a double standard. Plus size people are harassed, while average size people are praised when speaking about the same topic, small airplane seats. Jaylee, why should you be entitled to special treatment? Raising the cost of travel for everybody else because you're obese. Maximum self-entitlement, zero self-accountability. Economy airplane seats are deliberately designed to fit as many people as possible because they're trying to maximize profits for their company. The idea that airlines would sacrifice hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue in order to satisfy people like Jalen is completely bizarre. Speaking of bizarre, that word barely even begins to describe our candidate for lust. Lust is thought of as intense sex desire, especially when that desire leads to your judgment being clouded and causing you to make decisions you wouldn't otherwise make. There's one YouTuber in particular that allowed his lust to cloud his judgment making process so much that it led to the complete destruction of his life. This YouTuber is an autistic individual by the name of Christine Weston Chandler, or just Chris Chan. We can pinpoint the beginning of Chris's lust with what he calls his quote unquote love quest. To understand the love quest, you need to know that Chris has an obsession with video games and commonly thinks of his own life through a gamified reality lens. That being said, The Love Quest is a real-life game Chris created for himself which centers around him getting a girlfriend. The most prominent victim of The Love Quest is a woman named Megan Schroeder. Chris met Megan at his local game slash hobby store called The Game Place. He quickly took a liking towards Megan because she was a girl that was actually willing to talk to him. The two formed a friendship over their shared love of My Little Pony, video games, and anime. And according to the Chris Chan wiki, his friendship with Megan became the closest relationship Chris had with another person. But this friendship quickly took a turn for the worse when Chris's lustful urges got the better of him. Right around this time when Chris's friendship with Megan was blossoming, people on the internet would take notice of Chris's existence and a wiki page written about him would spring up in Encyclopedia Dramatica. Seeing this page, Chris wanted to edit out the parts he perceived as negative, but in doing this editing, he made a massive mistake. Chris removed certain words he found offensive, like but when it came to the wiki image gallery, instead of removing posts, he added more. These images included illustrations of his character Sonichu and an infamous drawing of him and Megan engaging in a certain act. Once Megan learned about this drawing, she understandably cut ties with Chris for good. But compared to the next big event in the Chris Chan story, the drawing looks like nothing. Quote unquote trolls are one of the main reasons that the internet has the knowledge and understanding it does about some of the more intimate aspects of Chris's life. By pretending to be his friend and having conversations with him, trolls got Chris to expose a litany of details about his lustful actions, including the fact that he hired multiple 
prostitutes consume copious amounts of online pee, purchased a wide range of toys, and recorded himself engaging in a certain activity with a blow-up doll. While those things may seem pretty bad, they're honestly pretty normal compared to the exchanges with the troll where Chris revealed a horrific story which he said was strictly confidential. I brought her with care and caution, gave her comfort and talked with her, and I encouraged her positively, let her make the first move. But how did this happen? How did this come about? Well, mainly I was really, really hoping and doing like I really needed to do a release. Chris had been making successful advances on his elderly, dementia-ridden mother. After this information was made public, Chris's mother was put on a protection order, with Chris himself being subsequently arrested. But potentially the scariest part of the story is that Chris's lawyer was successful in getting the incest charge dismissed with an autism deferment, making Chris a free man. While Chris Chan may be physically free, it's definitely fair to say that he's locked in a prison of his own mind, something he has in common with our candidate for greed. The sin of greed is thought of as an intense and selfish desire for more than something than is needed. And on YouTube, the perfect candidate for this sin is Dark Side Phil. Phil is what you would call an e-beggar. He places the responsibility of his livelihood in the hands of his audience instead of taking personal ownership of it himself. To understand this greedy mentality, we have to go back to Phil's beginnings and see exactly what went wrong. In the early 2010s, Phil was one of the first people on YouTube to begin uploading Let's Plays. He made his videos by pointing a camera at his TV and allowing the camera's built-in microphone to record his commentary. At the time, Phil was making good money. The lack of competition meant he would frequently appear on the front page of YouTube, and due to his surplus of gameplay, he was pumping out over a dozen videos a day. Phil was on a winning streak, but unfortunately, the streak wouldn't last long as his greedy desires began to slowly come to light. Phil decided the money he was naturally generating off his videos wasn't enough, so he made a video instructing his viewers to click on ads whenever they see them. Please go to my partner channel, The King of Hate HD, and click on the ads that show up on the videos there because hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, that actually starts giving me some, some money back for what I'm doing. I mean, it's not cheap to do what I'm doing. I bought a lot of games, a lot of equipment. This practice is strictly forbidden by YouTube, so after Phil made that video, his AdSense account was subsequently banned. To replace his lost income, Phil started to stream on Twitch, but the unedited nature of of live streaming was a double-edged sword. On one hand, donations and subs more than made up for the lost AdSense money, but on the other hand, Phil's greed was revealed like never before. I really did not like tonight's stream. I stayed extra late for you guys and basically it amounted to nothing. Um, no one's really supported, which pisses me off. Tomorrow's my day off. It sure would be great if you were going to support the stream today if you could tip me because that means I have those funds for my day off tomorrow. Please continue to tip, that helps a ton. The tips are my life's blood day to day. I can't have tips completely drying up now in the next several weeks because we have gifted memberships. That would literally be disaster for me. I would not be able to pay anything. Based on what Phil is saying, you would assume he was struggling financially, which he most likely was, but the internet would discover an absolutely insane detail that Phil never mentioned. He was spending the majority of his money on in-app purchases of a mobile game. Phil had frequently spoke about how he was addicted to mobile games, but fans didn't realize the true extent of his addiction until they discovered an account on a game called WWE Champions. Based off calculating how much the account's progression would have cost, they came up with $38,000 an absolutely insane amount to spend on a mobile game while begging and constantly complaining about how difficult your financial situation is. Phil definitely did a lot of embarrassing stuff throughout his career on the internet, but it would be pretty hard to argue that he was ever truly malicious, a word which is the perfect descriptor of our candidate for envy. The sin of envy is thought of as having a longing arousal for someone else's possessions, especially when that arousal causes the subject extreme pain or discomfort. In the case of our candidate, he became so consumed by envy he ended up unaliving six people. Our candidate is Elliot Roger. Elliot, unlike the other candidates, didn't have a sizable audience on YouTube, but still had a decent library of videos uploaded to the site before his account was terminated, making him a YouTuber nonetheless. From the videos we do know he posted, we can observe they were mostly rants about how girls didn't want him. Here I am, after living a horrible, unjust life, a wasted youth, deprived of any, any sort of fun or enjoyment or pleasure, all because females 
were never attracted to me. This anger towards girls and envy towards guys that could get girls pretty much controlled his life. He wrote in his manifesto, the most meanest and depraved of men come out on top and women flock to these men. Their evil acts are rewarded by women while the good, decent men are laughed at. I hated the girls even more than the bullies because of this. It seemed like Elliot saw the world through the nice guys finish last mentality where the popular guys are all evil villains. In one part of his manifesto that really highlights his envy, he says, I began to have fantasies of becoming very powerful and stopping everyone from having s**t. I wanted to take their s**t away from them, just like they took it away from me. When Elliot began his time at college, he was exposed to far more couples and quote unquote popular guys. Elliot wrote that during this time, he saw a couple kissing outside Starbucks, followed them to their car, and threw his coffee on them. Afterwards, he wrote, It was at this point in my life I realized I was capable of doing such things. I would happily do such things. I was capable of killing them, and I wanted to. This was also the first time Elliot was living alone for an extended period of time. Without regular time with his family, he could dive much deeper into his twisted fantasies. During this era, he spent a lot of his days on the internet in online forums where he spoke to other guys who shared his hatred of women but who were quote unquote too cowardly to act on it. Sadly, on the morning of May 23rd, 2014, Elliot decided he would act on it. Right after he woke up, Elliot unalived his three roommates. He then headed to Starbucks where he ordered a coffee and uploaded his final YouTube video titled Elliot Rogers Retribution. Girls gave their affection and s and love to other men, but never to me. I'm 22 years old and I'm still a virgin. He then drove to a UC Santa Barbara sorority house and banged on the door. After no one let him in, he unalived two women who happened to be walking by. Elliot, who was now being pursued by the police, drove through Isla Vista shooting into stores from his car, sadly unaliving one more man. He then parked up and turned his weapon on himself. By mercilessly taking those innocent lives, Elliot proved he was a complete narcissist, a personality trait which is unfortunately shared with our candidate for pride. The sin of pride is thought of as an excessive love of one's own excellence, intelligence, and abilities. There's also another important aspect to this sin, which is having a blindness to your own actions, always believing you are right regardless of the evidence. In the YouTube world, the perfect candidate for this sin is a man known as Quantum TV, or Jermel. Unlike the other YouTubers on this list, Jermel started his YouTube channel with a very technical purpose in mind, to review TVs. He consistently pumped out reviews for the newest and hottest TVs by ordering them from Best Buy, recording his review, and returning them a few days later. In these videos, Jermel wore a Deadpool mask and adopted the strange post-production strategy of recording his voiceover for the review and the footage of himself in the mask separately. He then listens to his voiceover in the background and makes the hand and head motions he believes are appropriate. At this point in time, Jermel had built up a reputation as someone who was a bit weird when it came to his approach to making videos, but no one would have called him sinister. This was something which was unfortunately about to change. In 2018, YouTube released a new feature which allowed creators to offer a paid membership to their audience. Jermel used this membership to provide access to what he called his TV calibration service. Although, the concept of this membership offer makes no sense because calibration is unique to every individual TV, and the information Jermel was offering could be easily found on the internet. Taking note of this horrible offer, another YouTuber by the name of Ninjitian uploaded a critical video titled, I gave Quantum TV $5 for LG OLED settings, here's what happened. Jermel, not happy with his membership being presented in a negative light, filed a copyright takedown request of the video. While submitting this claim, Jermel showed for the first time the extent that Pride had infected his mindset by completely lying to YouTube. It's not so much the copyright strike, it was the back and forth in the email chain with YouTube, because you get to see everything. He victimizes himself in the copyright claims. He was stating, you know, this guy is harassing my family, he's going after my mentally disabled brother. Like all this stuff that I had no clue about. His claim was promptly rejected by YouTube as the video in question was clearly fair use. Although this copyright drama would look like nothing compared to the series of events that would finally expose Quantum TV's pride to the entire world. In March of 2022, Jermel uploaded a negative review of the widely loved video game Elden Ring. This video inspired a very small YouTuber by the name of Mischief to make a response video to Jermel's review where he points out the nonsensical nature of many of the points. 
Jermel was not happy with this video, so he left a comment saying he would copyright strike it if it wasn't quickly removed. Mischief, only being 16, they didn't have a clear understanding about the way YouTube DMCA's work, so he complied with Jermel and removed the video. Although, Jermel had no idea that this was the moment that would snowball into his online reputation being completely destroyed. Upset about his situation, Mischief got into contact with a much larger creator, The Axeman, who covered the situation in a video titled The Worst Elden Ring Hot Takes, in which Jermel had a section in. Similar to his response video with Mischief, Jermel also submitted a takedown request on The Actman. This request was then subsequently denied by YouTube. Jermel, being unsatisfied with YouTube's decision, decided to take matters into his own hands and call The Actman's mom. Your son has been making a string of uh, really defamatory posts about things he doesn't necessarily understand, and I want to try to talk about this. He's harassing the hell out of me, really, if I'm being quite honest with you, ma'am. And I, I think at this point, if he doesn't stop, my only choice would be legal action. This call led the act man to stay silent on the situation for the time being. Eventually, a new response video would be made by the act man as well as Quantum TV, both of whom were trying to make the case to YouTube to get each other banned. But all of this would result in nothing as both YouTubers are still posting to this day. Even though YouTube didn't take any action, the action of the community is clear as Quantum struggles to break the 8,000 view mark on his videos, meaning he struggles to engage even 10% of his roughly 80,000 subscribers. In the case of Quantum TV, he never had much to lose to begin with, as his current subscriber count is still relatively small compared to the other candidates in this video, such as our candidate for Wrath, who would have been set for life off of her lucrative channel if she could just have avoided falling into her sin. Wrath is defined as extreme anger. It's unique from the other sins because you could definitely make the argument that there's a decent amount of time when Wrath is justified, but in the case of our candidate for Wrath, her extreme anger was incited off of pretty much nothing. Our candidate is Ruby Frank, the creator of a Mormon family vlog channel called 8 Passengers that boasted an impressive 2.5 million subscribers before it was deleted in early 2023. At first glance, 8 Passengers appeared to be a normal family vlog channel. They adopted the common practice of filming virtually every moment of their life, including family vacations, birthday parties, injuries, and more. Despite their innocent image, it would only take a little investigation to figure out that whenever the kids did anything that the parents didn't like, they would receive an extremely unfair punishment. Some of the most egregious examples of these punishments included targeted starvation. I know that her teacher is uncomfortable with her being hungry and not having a lunch. I responded and just said, Eve is responsible for making her lunches in the morning, and she actually told me she did pack a lunch. Taking away quote unquote bedroom privileges. My bedroom was taken away for seven months, and then you give it back like a couple weeks ago. I don't think our viewers know that. You were sleeping on a beanbag. I was sleeping on a beanbag since <laughs> October. And not getting Christmas presents for certain kids. We told them that this year they are not going to be visited by santa christmas morning their four older siblings will be getting christmas presents to open and that they will have the gift of love from their dad and i once the internet began finding out about this pattern of parenting the eight passengers channel views began to take a nosedive as their core audience was abandoning them ruby not liking her newfound internet infamy decided to delete the channel only one month after the deletion the true extent of the child abuse was revealed to the world after the youngest son was found by a neighbor, emaciated, malnourished, and covered in wounds. After the boy was found, police quickly searched the eight passengers' household, where his sister was found in a similar condition. Fortunately, the story does have somewhat of a happy ending, as Ruby Frank will be serving the next 15 years in prison. While Ruby's reputation is pretty much decimated, there may actually be someone who the internet hates even more than her, our candidate for sloth. Sloth is essentially thought of as extreme laziness. Surprisingly, our candidate for Sloth is one of the biggest creators on the platform, SS Sniperwolf or Leah. Now we all know about Leah's lazy TikTok react content and how that content would be more than enough to give her her place in the sin of Sloth. But there is another occurrence that flew mostly under the radar that takes her Sloth to the next level. Towards the end of 2021, a terminally ill 10-year-old went on the No Jumper podcast. While she was in the No Jumper studio, Adam22 and the other hosts were basically trying to provide this girl with the best day ever, giving her clothes, money, and anything she wanted. Although, there was one thing that the little girl wanted more than anything, to meet her favorite YouTuber, SniperWolf. Try to get in touch with her. I know some people in know her, so hopefully we can make it happen. Wait, really? 
Eventually, Adam is successful in connecting to Leah and passes her contact info over to the mom of the girl. What ensues is a back and forth between Leah and the mom where Leah blows off the meeting with the girl over and over again until the mom gets frustrated after days of back and forth and sends Leah this message. You know, my daughter looks up to you. She loves you. Watched you her whole cancer treatment the past year. You shouldn't have even reached out because then I could have just told Kiara we tried. What makes the situation even worse is that Leah was out enjoying herself during this time, posting the cake she was eating on her Instagram story. Unfortunately, it seems like the cake was a more important priority than a five-minute call with a terminally ill fan. 